I'm going to have a look um, at the actual empirical evidence of who voted for Peter Casey as found in the Red Sea exit poll. Um, Peter Casey was a candidate in the Irish presidential election, which happened this weekend. Uh, he's become the centre of discussion afterwards, despite the fact that he got less than half the vote of the winner of the election, which was Michael T. Higgins. Um, and that's basically because a legitimate reason of his vote increasing an awful lot in the last two weeks, from about 2% to about 24%, um, and the basis of that being him coming out with racist remarks that targeted uh, the most, probably most marginalised section of the Irish population, the travelling community. Um, and what I want to talk about is the media interpretations of that, and in particular, the big problem that some of the media have started to, following media interpretations of Trump and Brexit, have come out with this idea that it's all to do with economic anxiety, uh, people who are economically suffering and deciding to vote for some right-wing asshole uh, as a protest vote. The data suggests that isn't true, so we're going to look at that. So what we're going to be looking at is the Red Sea uh, exit poll data, which was done with RTE. Um, and exit polls are great uh, because with elections you get a result, but you don't really know why people voted in a particular way. And you don't really uh, know who, what sort of people uh, voted in a particular way. And you get all sorts of journalistic opinion, uh, which are based on wild guesses on those. Um, and they can solidify and people believe them. Uh, but actually having a look at the data in the exit poll can sort of knock those on the head. Uh, I've done this with both the US election um, with Trump getting elected and British Brexit thing. And in both cases, that amounted to serious challenges to the media narrative, particularly with Trump, because when you look at the exit poll data, you discover that far from economic anxiety being the reason he got elected, his biggest, uh, the biggest, the people who voted for him more than any other type of people were actually rich white men. That was his biggest constituency. But anyway, let's move on to this Red Sea um, thing. So. Uh, let's quick mention of the methodology. They surveyed 3,474 people who had just voted uh, at 138 polling stations across the country. And then they asked them. So looking at the detail of the exit poll, uh, well, first of all, uh, is there anything that backs up this story of uh, economic anxiety of the people left behind? Um, not really. Um, the Closest measure you could get is the uh, uh, class uh, differential. It uses this ABC1 uh, C2DE measure, which is not that useful anymore. It's kind of like from the 1950s. You know, so it has the working class, uh, middle class divided into being about manual work and, um, and uh, brain work. Uh, not really the way the Irish economy works very much anymore. So, like a lot of um, a lot of technical workers would be in that ABC one category in Canada as as middle class. Uh, but anyway, the actual difference between these two is not very big at all. And it, as you'll see, it's the smallest of all the differences. Um, and when you consider that that C two D E grouping includes uh, pensioners, who are by far the biggest group receiving social welfare in Ireland and that Casey's vote was strongest among 65s, I suspect if you could equalize all that out, uh, the difference would almost vanish entirely. Um, so that narrative, no real uh, support for it whatsoever. But there are some really big divides in other areas, and they offer an alternative way of understanding who voted for Casey and why. So we can jump straight to one of them, and it's a really big divide, and that's between men and women. Uh, what you see is that there's about 26% of uh, men voted for Casey, but only about 16% of women. So men were quite a lot more likely to vote for Casey. Can we explain this? Um, well, obviously, economic anxiety is neither here nor there. You know, there's no major differences. If anything, women tend to be in more economically uh, precarious positions than men. Um, that that there's a, there would be a difference the other way in this. Um, but what Casey was trading off, and what you hear in the vox pops over and over and over, 
is people saying they voted for him because he wasn't afraid to say what he thinks and he was against political correctness. Now, media commentary, unfortunately, just sort of accepts those categories and doesn't say, well, what do people mean by that, right? Um, what they mean, and I'll, I'll come back to this later, uh, right-wingers in particular, uh, is political correctness is essentially a code for I'm not allowed to say racist and sexist stuff. Um, and it's not that you know, they think they're not allowed to say it because the police will knock down the door. Uh, you know, we don't have hate crime legislation in Ireland. Um, it's because they feel if they say it, then other people will say, hey, come on, you can't be saying that. That's really unacceptable. Personally, I think there's a lot to be said for that sort of setup where people can't come out with racist and sexist stuff, targeting people who are more marginalised and punching down, as people put it. I think it's one of the um, uh, uh, major step forwards we've had in culture in the last few years that, uh, you know, your racist uncle doesn't feel he can come out uh, with racist terms at the Christmas dinner table. Uh, doesn't feel he can use them in work against people um, that are uh, that he's you know the boss of. Uh, you know doesn't feel he can shed these things at people on the streets. So you know this kind of say it as he says what he thinks without a filter. Actually, that's not great. And of course. Um, women would have much more experience than most men at being on the wrong side of that filter, at being, you know, being the targets of misogynistic language in particular. And perhaps that's the reason why uh, women found Casey's uh, speaking straight uh, selling point much, much less attractive than men did. Okay, so that's, a re that's one of the biggest divides. I think if you wanted to explain Casey's vote, then that's actually where you'd have to start. Uh, but the other big divide is in age, and this will have some relevance later as we'll get into the uh, detail. Um, so only about 16% of 18 to 34 year olds said they'd voted for Casey, but almost 24% of uh, 65 uh, plus people did. Uh, so that divide, that's almost as big as the gender divide, um, quite a significant one and it will have some other repercussions. Uh, we know from other social attitude surveys that young people are very much less accepting of racism and sexism than older people. They're very much more likely uh, to speak out themselves against that. So again, they were not uh, attracted to Casey's uh, racist messaging, essentially. Um, now, the other thing we can think about here is the urban-rural divide in his vote, which was also quite significant. Uh, so we see he's getting 26% of rural voters as against only 18% of urban voters. And in fact, when you look across here to Dublin, you see he's only getting 14.2% 14, 14 of Dublin voters. Um, that argues against the economic anxiety uh, interpretation. I mean, the biggest crisis uh, that everybody in Ireland is facing at the moment is the housing crisis. Uh, rents have become completely unaffordable. Um, if, you're, if you don't already have a house, it would, it's almost impossible to buy a house in a city uh, for most people. And of course that massively affects younger people um, who are far less likely to be homeowners. Uh, and of course massively affects people who live in the urban areas and in particular in Dublin. House prices, rent prices in Dublin, completely out of control. 80% of the population couldn't, you know, couldn't afford them if they had to start from scratch. So if economic anxiety was going to be our explanatory factor, then we would expect Casey's votes to be highest in those areas. So we expect him to have a higher vote in Dublin. He doesn't, he's got a tiny vote in Dublin, 14%. Uh, we'd expect him to have a higher vote amongst the young, who are the people who are stuck with no option but to rent and completely unaffordable rents that they're spending half of their income on, or that they're you know, cramming, well, actually they're spending half of their income on and they're sharing uh, bedrooms very commonly. They're, they're forced to do both of those things. So on, on, on both of those measures, economic anxiety explanation, it just falls apart, it collapses. All right, so the next thing I want to look at here is the uh, transfers. Um, so 
in the election itself because Higgins won a majority in the first round. We didn't see where the transfers were getting. Tally people were making a guess at them, but we didn't see the detail. In the exit poll, they asked people who they transferred to, uh, and so we can get an idea of that. And it's an interesting story. Um, so the first uh, interesting aspect is Michael D. Higgins' vote, uh, and what we see is actually quite a lot of it uh, people were transferring, giving their number two preferences to Peter Casey. Now, in terms of the narrative of there being an enormous gap between who Michael D. Higgins was and who Peter Casey is, that's kind of interesting, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but much more telling in that regard is when we look at where Peter Casey's transfers were going, because actually quite a big chunk of them were going to Michael D. Higgins, 27%. If you go back and you look at the opinion polls uh, before Casey gets his racist bump ahead of the election, so he's at 2%, uh, and Michael D. Higgins is at over 60%. And in fact, it's a reasonable interpretation looking at the opinion polls and then the results to say that Michael D. Higgins lost about 10% of his vote to Peter Casey. So why would those 10% of people have switched? Uh, the only reasonable explanation I can come up with is that they were attracted to Peter Casey's racism, that, that you know, they heard him come out with the anti-traveller stuff and they went, great, that's me, I want people to be able to say racist stuff. And so they voted for Casey rather than Higgins. This sort of runs a bit against the narrative the media has presented of the election of, you know, the, the lefty poet uh, against this kind of reactionary Trump-like figure. Um, and I think there's a warning in this for the left, um, because the problem, and we've seen this problem play out really badly in other countries, is that although Higgins does a great speech, he's, he's personally, he's obviously on the left, uh, he's also an establishment candidate. He's a candidate who was backed uh, right across by the political spectrum and by Fine Gael in particular. He came under a lot of attacks uh, during the election for doing stuff like signing off on the eviction bill. And a lot of people on the left um, defended that in constitutional terms, you know, that his role as the president didn't allow him not to sign. Or he came under attack for not explicitly coming out against austerity. And again, you saw a lot of the people on the left defending that on the grounds that the president, you know, can't make speeches unless the government has approved the text. I mean, technically, that's true. Um, but uh, would people offer the same sort of technical explanations of Fine Gael and governments? You know, would they offer the same sort of technical explanations of even when the Labour Party were in government? If you, you, know, you think back to uh, the attempts by the smaller Trotskyist parties to bring uh, amendments to repeal the Eighth, uh, they were explained by the same sort of technical language. And I think the problem is that this meant that the election created the impression amongst a lot of people that the left is part of the establishment, that they say exactly the same things as the establishment does, that you know they can comfortably back somebody who is being backed by Fina Gale, and all the stories about using the private jet and all the, you know, the, uh, the expenses of the presidency fill into that same sort of category. People seeing them as a, as a problem, and the left going, oh no, no, this is just what you do as part of the job. Technically true. But again, creates this impression, and it, it's it, that that more than anything else, they sort of Trump figures or the Casey figures can make hay out of. I mean, he's an American, he's a millionaire, you know, based in America, who flew back in for the election. He was getting his pride, he was flying his helicopter around when he was getting nominations from council meetings. So his sort of um, his claim that Michael D is the establishment and he's not is completely ludicrous on that level. Uh, but to a lot of people, they just hear the defence. And I think there needs to be a lot more caution about that and, and a lot more care around playing this one side against the other. Lesser evil is in politics. Vote for Michael D to stop Casey. It's the sort of thing that could quite badly backfire on us. And to a certain extent, that's exactly what's happened in Brazil over the weekend with the election of somebody who's pretty much an open fascist. Um, you know, that could go quite disastrously wrong. But the discrediting of the Workers' Party in the sense that they were had become the establishment was part of that story. Bigger topic, won't get into that any further now, but I do want to look at some other aspects of this exit poll.
So the next bit I want to look at is uh, what people saw as important in deciding how the vote would go. Uh, and there's a very stark contrast between Michael D and Peter Casey here. That sort of echoes my warning from the last bit about a stat, you know, being perceived as being part of the establishment. Uh, so as you might expect, the uh, really attractive things people found with Michael D were his track record and experience. You know, 34% of voters said that was it. Uh, his uh, suitability to represent Ireland abroad, which is 21%, so he's already you know, got over half his voters are coming from that, and his um, knowledge of the constitutional role of the president being about 18%. Um, Casey scores really badly on all of those uh, in comparison. They didn't influence very many of his voters at all, and that makes complete sense. Uh, I mean, he, he'd be quite clueless. However, uh, what was his attraction? Well, perhaps it's not very surprising, a stance on political and social issues, that's about a third of his voters, Essentially, that's his racist remarks and targeting people on social welfare. That, you know, what other issues, what other stances did he have? Um, and secondly, his ability to stand up for ordinary people, which is 32%. Interesting thing there in terms of, well, what is ordinary people? What are people's understanding of that? Completely picked up on critically by the media, people talking about Middle Ireland. Bizarrely, I've even seen people talking about his vote reflecting a silent majority. I'm pretty sure the 23-24% is actually not a majority, it's a minority. Um, you're getting less than half the Higgins vote, that a minority vote. But uh, when these media narratives get constructed, they often constructed around very weak and flimsy and, in that case, completely incorrect information. Um, so there again, we're seeing, you know, Casey essentially getting a vote because he wants to be able to say stuff that would nowadays be seen correctly as being racist and misogynist. Um, not Nobody particularly being convinced he'd be a good candidate, pretty much atypical, uh, uh, sorry, pretty much typical uh, protest vote material there. Uh, but where will that go? So the last point I want to make on all of this, and it's basically uh, a point about the probable hypocrisy of the KC voters. Now, Really, unfortunately, although Red Sea must have this information, they haven't as yet published it. So uh, if you work in Red Sea and you're listening to this, maybe you should go back because there's a good story here. Because in, in there, you've data not only on the people who said they were going to vote for Peter Casey, but also how those people then told you they were going to vote on the blasphemy referendum. Because Red Sea also covered the blasphemy referendum and they have a few uh, questions, the whole section on it, basically down here. And um, what I'm interested in, and it suggests something to us, is, I mean, it was passed uh, overwhelmingly, um, but who said, who told Red Sea they were voting for it, and who told Red Sea they were voting against? And how does that compare to who was telling them that they were voting for and against Casey? Um, so what we see this time around, there's no gender divide, you know, at all showing up. But the two other divides that map onto the uh, divide of who was voting for Peter Casey. Uh, the first of these is age. Um, and it's actually quite a similar pattern to what we saw for the Casey vote. Uh, 18 to 24 year olds overwhelmingly voted to abolish blasphemy as an offence from the Irish Constitution, massively so. However, that over 65 group, who were also the ones who were more inclined to vote Casey than any other group, uh, they voted only narrowly to abolish uh, blasphemy from the Constitution. If we look at the urban rural divide, it's not as pronounced, but there's certainly also. Uh, so urban voters were much more, were quite a bit more likely uh, to vote to abolish blasphemy. Uh, and quite a bit less likely to vote for Casey. Uh, rural voters reversed that pattern. So that's kind of interesting because if Casey's supposed attraction is, um, you know, being allowed to say things as he sees it and not to have to be politically correct, well, how do you square um, that? How do you square with people wanting to be able to come out with racist or misogynist stuff with being opposed to people being able to blaspheme. 
how does that work if you know your thing is free speech and being able to say things as you think they are and the answer to that is of course it doesn't work you know and what this shows and it would be really great to see it confirmed from the red sea data itself but i think it's a reasonable supposition here is that the same pattern exists here as we see from right wingers elsewhere they have no interest whatsoever in free speech uh, they have no interest in um, political correctness or opposing political correctness what they want to do is they want to be able to allow racist <clears throat> and sexist and homophobic hate speech. They want to no longer be challenged when they come out with that. They want that to be acceptable again. Uh, but at the same time, they want to shut up feminists. They want to shut up anti-racists. They want to shut up anti-fascists. And if you follow the, the right wing online, you'll see this over and over and over again being confirmed. You know, that they want, to, they want to shut down, for instance, gender studies departments in universities. And actually the right wing government of Hungary recently did just that. And it was very noticeable that all the kind of supposed free speech pundits had nothing to say in opposition to it. Or in fact, quite a lot were welcoming that. Um, so, this, this ter political correctness term that you know, the media seem to accept without challenge, without even thinking about it, uh, when you start digging into it, that's what it's cover for. It, it's cover for, hey, I want to be racist and I want to be sexist, but I don't want you to be able to challenge me. And I also want to be able to shut you up if you want to talk about feminism, if you want to talk about anti-fascism, or you want to talk about anti-racism. Uh, and it's important to recognize that and to avoid the mistake that some on the left have made of playing along with that and thinking that opposition to political correctness is, is something they can get on board with as well. It's actually a good thing uh, that in the world we live in, it has become less acceptable to be openly racist. It has become less acceptable to be openly sexist. It has become less acceptable to be homophobic. That's a gain of struggle of the last 50 years, particularly the last 20 years, and it is something that is very well worth defining, defending against Peter Casey and his ilk today.